All right, here we go. Woo! Woo, woo, woo. No sooner were both men gone than the head of the pretty, fair-haired young woman appeared at the window. Going to see Mr. Crow, are ye? She murmured to herself. Going to surprise your little Nancy with a hundred pounds, I don't think. And then, kneeling on the floor with her elbows on the window still, Nancy Sickles caught sight of young Mr. Gl Mrs. Glover and her baby reclining in a wicker chair by the edge of her tiny lawn, while Mr. Glover, the ironmonger, with a large pair of garden scissors, was trimming the staggling, straggling border of a bed of London pride. At once, the girl's thoughts ceased to be malicious or vindictive or even self-pitiful. She thrust her fingers into her apron pocket and extracted a little sticky paper bag. Out of this, she took a lemon drop and put it in her mouth. It'll be twelve months old next Thursday, Billy Glover will. That's nice for Betty, Betsy Jane, the way Mr. Glover do stay at home on closing day and tidy up garden. It was as if some great consolatory spirit in things, perfectly indifferent to the blood and iron activities of her mate and her mate's alley, now began to pour out upon this head at the window, lemon drop and all, everything that it had to bestow. A wood pigeon's voice became audible in the small lime trees at the bottom of Mr. Glover's garden, and in spite of the noise of the traffic in the street in front, it was possible to catch the pleasant sound of a lawnmower in the garden beyond Mr. Glover's. That mysterious relaxing of everything hard, everything tense and strung up, that comes with autumn, was all around Nancy as she looked out, breathing a vague, cider-sweet smell of apples. If moss and primroses were the prominent spring scent in Glossybury, apples were the autumn one. This particular day was indeed as characteristic of autumn in Somerset as any day could be. A blue haze was over everything, so thick and intense, that it was as if the blueness in the sky had fallen upon the earth, leaving only a vague, gray hollowness in the upper air. This blue haze invaded everything. It crept through gaps and hedges. It floated over old crumbling walls. It slipped into open stick houses and hay sheds. And though it was blue in color, it smelled strongly of brown mud and of yellow apples. This blue mist, reeking of cider juice and ditches, seems to possess a peculiar somnolent power. Travelers from the north, or from the east, coming into Glastonbury by train through Wareham, may be sitting erect and alert as they pass Stallbridge and Telecom, but they will find it difficult to keep their eyes on the landscape when the train has carried them beyond Evercreech and they come into the purlies of Avalon. Sleep seems to emanate from this district like a thin, penetrating anesthetic, possessed of a definite healing power, and it is a sleep full of dreams, not of the gross, violent, repulsive dreams of the night, but of lovely, floating, evasive daydreams, lighter, more voluptuous, nearer the heart's desire than the raw, crude, violent versions of the bed. Nancy Stickles felt a wave of delicious languor steal over her as she contemplated the Glover family, enjoying themselves on their little lawn, and as she watched the blue mist floating over the old walls and lying in hollows between the narrow valleys and hovering in pigsty doors and privy doors and foul run doors and flowing like the vaporous essence of some great blue apple of the orchards of space over everything she could see. She felt quite friendly to her husband. He never struck her. He never abused her. He always gave her exactly the same sum of money every Saturday, whatever receipts the shop brought in. He didn't drink. He praised her cooking. But on the other hand, oh, how happy she always was when he was well out of the way and she was left alone. Well, I believe my tea is done steeping, so I'll be right back. i got to go pick it up. Well, there you are. Tea is here. 
tea and a nice cozy book. What more could you want on a humid, hot summer night? Uh, where was I? There must have been something in Nancy of the unconquerable zest for life that the gods had given to old Mother Leg, who was her great aunt. She was an extraordinarily pretty girl, and she had so fair and clear a complexion as such a rounded figure that people turned to look at her as she went by. But Nancy had no self-pity, and never occurred to her that she had been wronged by God or by humanity between because her father died at the workhouse and her mother in the country asylum. County asylum. Not country asylum. County asylum. Or because she had been cajoled by the accident of propiquinty. Propiquinty? Propiquinty? Propiquinty. I don't know. Into marrying the poorest and most miserably of old Glastonbury's tradesmen. She did not like it very much when Red Robinson, her husband's friend, showed a tendency to take liberties with her. But she managed to rebuff him without making trouble. And as soon as he was out of sight, he had the power of casting him she had the power of casting him from her thoughts. Nancy Stickles was perhaps more perfectly adjusted to the wave of nature and to the terms upon which we all live upon the earth than any other conscious person in Glatzenbury except Mr. Wallop and Bert Cole. But Nancy had a double advantage over both these adherents of the visible world in the fact that she included many undertones and overtones of a psychological character completely out of reach of Bert and the ex-mayor. She shared with her great aunt a certain rebellage and habit of mind, or at least a habit of mind that liked like none the worse because of its animal basis. Like life, none of the worse. I gotta look up who this character is again. We're gonna spend so much time with her. Nancy Stichel's a devoted disciple of Mr. Garrett. That's all it says. Tossy Stickles is Elizabeth Crow's servant. I believe Nancy Stickles is a servant too, isn't she? It's hard to keep track of everybody after a while, you know. Ba ba ba. At this moment, for example, when it became clear that Billy Glover had forgot where he was and was being carried kicking and screaming into the house, Nancy Stickles felt no repugnance. If she'd been called upon at this moment to give Billy Glover a bath, she would have gone into Billy's room without the flicker of a sigh and began soon looking out of Billy's window, just as she was now looking out of Harry's. When not in acute physical pain, or in the presence of acute physical pain, Nancy Stickles enjoyed every moment of life. She liked to touch life, hear life, smell life, taste life, see life. But she went far beyond Mr. Wallop and Bert, as she did indeed beyond everybody in Gladstonbury except its present mayor, in the enjoyment of religion. To Nancy Stickles, God was a dignified, well-meaning, but rather helpless person, like Parson Decker. Christ was a lovable, but rather disturbing person, like Sam Decker. The Holy Spirit was, quite simply and quite reverently, a very large and very voluble wood pigeon. But all these entities moved to and fro in an inner, behind-stage Glastonbury. Glastonbury with greener fields, a redder chalice well, yellower apples, and even bluer mists than the one Nancy knew best, but one, all the same, that she felt frequently conscious of, and towards which her deepest feminine soul expanded in delicious waves of admiration, hope, and love. <sighs> Nothing like hot tea at a hot summer night. It was not every woman in Gladstonbury, for instance, who, running down now to answer, a light ring at the closed chemist's door, and finding her husband's relative Tossie, obviously pretty far advanced in her pregnancy, standing in the doorway, would have greeted her with the lively hug and kiss of Nancy's welcome. Tossie, however, showed no sign of being surprised at these manifestations. Everyone knew that Nancy were only for kissing and cuddling, and the younger damsel behaved now with a grave, indulgent toleration and an air that seemed to say, We women have a right to be made a fuss of by you girls, 
But if you'd had our experience in life, you would be less excited. Well, the two of them moved together into the back garden and sat down on the bench under the wall, lately occupied by Harry and Red. The yellow cat was no longer in sight, and the young mistress of the house very soon carried off the unsightly scrubbing mops. She even picked up the fragments of the earthenware bowl and carried them in. Tossie, sitting with folded hands, took no notice of these movements. Shan't be going to hospital till after Christmas, she remarked. Maybe not till the new year. Will ye be staying there, ye be till your time be come? That's what Mrs. Do say. But her'll have to good and girl to help soon in house. Me be being liable to be taken with dizzies. Do it feel pretty lonesome like when you do have they dizzies? Not particular, replied the other carelessly. As a matter of fact, up to the day, and indeed up to the day of her delivery, Tossie never had a flicker of either dizziness or faintness. Who be Miss Crow going to have into house to help be? Tossie proceeded to add to her air of a mother of the generations of the air of a bestower of sincere sinecures sinecures. Okay. She had asked if I knowed of a friend of me own maybe. And I told she I go around, I said I and I see Harry's wife Nancy. But of course I said being well to do people, as you might say, and high class tradesmen, it's doubtful if Nancy would come. I might come afternoons and evenings, said Nancy pensively. She was thinking to herself, and yet not thinking, for it was a less a definite process than that. Feeling, rather, with every ounce of her flesh, every nerve of her body, every pulse beat of her blood, that it would be extraordinarily pleasant to walk over to Benedict Street every afternoon and have tea with Tossie instead of at home. Harry rather likes getting his own tea, she said to herself. Could he cook dinner and help by washing up, cried Tossie eagerly. They'd be having nothing to speak of for lunch. Goodness, Nance. But I'd dearly love for you to come. Twould drive all the faintings away to have thee there with I. Nancy pondered. I expect, she said, Harry would be pleased for me to go. He's been making terrible little shotties last year, owning to competition. Does Harry Letty's see what he do make? asked the sagacious Tossie. Or does he take it out at Till and tell her any tale it likes? Men prefers to manage their own business as a general rule, replied Nancy cautiously. And then to change the subject, she asked Tossie about Lady Rachel. Tossie became in a second extremely secretive and extremely consequential. She's unhappy. Anyone can see that. But she doesn't tell things to anyone. She only tells these things to folks that she don't know very well. Folks in house. Does Mr. Adling come over regular to see her? The importance printed on Tossie's countenance as she prepared to reply to this question delighted Nancy. All this was part of the undertones of life that she enjoyed quite as much as the littered surface. People can meet people when they wants to. Especially if they be ladies of title, without coming to house, can't they? Nancy's eyes sparkled with glee. The idea of being initiated into fashionable intrigue thrilled her. Maybe you'd like to walk up with you now and see Miss Crow, said Tossie casually. She spoke with the airy negligence of one royal ambassador throwing out a bait to another royal ambassador. Nancy got up from the bench, went to the window of the back room, the chemical dispensing room, and looked into the house. It was only five minutes to three by the clock in the small back room. The litter in the room, its hand-to-mouth look, not like a real chemist shop at all, like an extremely humble apothecary's place, where there might be a barber's chair, made her feel more than ever sure that Harry would agree to her going. Yes, if you have rested long enough, Tass, and are sure the walks won't tire you, I'd love to go with you now. I'm not a bit afraid of Miss Crow. 
She talked to me once on the cricket field and for a long time. I like her. She's nice. On their way, the two young women caught sight of John Crow hurrying along on the other side of the street. Is that there Mr. Crow still working for the mayor, Toss? inquired Nancy. Sure he is. And what is more, he's married his cousin who do live with old Miss Drew out to Abbey House. Mrs. went to call on him one day last week in Mrs. Mrs. Bowles' house in Northlode. They ain't only one got one room, they ain't. And tis all crowded with curtings and cushings and some like old ornaments. Taint like a real room, Mrs. did say. Tis like a studio in Chelsea Town. Did she tell you that, Toss? Me and Lady Rachel, replied Tossie. Be Mr. Crow working for the mayor still, Toss? Some say he be, and some say he ain't. Some say he be a Russian spy. But anyway, he be Philip Crow's cousin, though they ain't on speaking terms. What's this I hear, Toss, about the mayor digging great pits in Chalice Hill for to find Jesus Christ's supper cup? That's just ignorant talk, explained Tossie with her superior level. Mr. Gerd Bank digging pits. He be setting up foundations. He be going to build a girl arch. Gert arch. So they do tell at our place and make thick red spring run under em. There be a wonderful lot of the foreigners come to Glaston since pageant day. Stop a minute, Nance, while I get me a breath. When you be as I be, you won't skip as you walks. Nancy obeyed, and they paused by the wall of St. Benignus. Sally Jones told I, whispered Tossie, in a tone as pregnant as her own form, that she heard the mayor tell her his lady there be a girt miracle when thick red water do run under his new arch. Sal said he looked like a prophet when he spoke of it. She said he told his wife about some Welshman of ancient days with a name which begins with a T like his own name. What writ about this mere miracle afore of King Arthur's time? Nancy contemplated the Tower of St. Benignus Church round with which several black swifts were cutting the misty air as he swayed and circled. Her eyes had an entranced faraway look in them. Oh, I'll just read this next paragraph because then there's a paragraph break. There be wondrous exciting times who do live in Toss. I've always had a mind that I'd live to see a miracle since I were confirmed in cathedral. As Nancy uttered these words, she laid her hand upon the wall of St. Benina's graveyard and gently stroked its green cushion of thick moss. Think, Toss, what it would be like, she went on in a low, odd voice, if there were a real miracle in Gladstonebury. Tossy Stickles felt she was deriving some comfort from the gentle pleasure, pressure of that old wall against her form, fecund frame than from any conceivable departure from the normal system of things. I don't lay no stocks on miracles, she said. I reckon tis because I've got so much on me mind. Well, there we go. That's Glastonbury for tonight. And I'll see you next time. Cheers.